Hello, welcome to the special session uh, on uh, international brain initiatives at the Neuroinformatics 2021. Uh, I'm Kenji Doya uh, at Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, uh, serving as a co-chair of the uh, Data Standards and the Sharing Working Group together with uh, uh, Miriam Mato. So uh, uh, as many of you know, uh, International uh, Brain Initiative uh, is a, a federation of uh, uh, brain initiatives from uh, seven uh, countries and regions around the world. Uh, Japan, Australia, EU, uh, Canada, uh, US, Korea, and China currently. So uh, obviously these uh, projects produce a lot of uh, data of many kinds and how we can make best use of those uh, data, that is the topic of our session today. So uh, uh, today, uh, I first uh, we first uh, ask uh, Jan Biare to introduce uh, the International Brain Initiative, and I will uh, introduce uh, our data standard sharing working group. And then we invited uh, two keynote speakers, uh, Dr. Ken Harris on uh, neural activity data, and Dr. Christian Harris for anatomy data. And we have uh, three talks uh, representing uh, three task forces uh, in a working group data governance, uh, data catalog, and uh, training. And then uh, we will have a discussion of uh, what kind of opportunity are, are there and what we need to do to uh, best utilize uh, the new coming data. And then, then before uh, closing by Mary. Okay, so uh, uh, let us uh, get started. Uh, first, uh, by introduction uh, of uh, uh, International Brain Initiative by Jan Biale, a member of the Strategy Committee of IBI. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm Jan Biale, Chair of the International Brain Initiative. I will give you an introduction to the IBI. So in the past decade, we have seen a wave of brain initiatives with the EU Human Brain Project and the US Brain Initiatives being the two first, then followed by China, Korea, Canada, Australia, and Japan. And together, these seven brain initiatives have formed the International Brain Initiative with a strategy committee with members from the initiatives, with a funders collective engaging the funding organizations interested in the neuroscience field and the stakeholders collective with key scientific societies and organizations and institutions um, interested in neuroscience. We have working groups providing the engine for activity and a facilitation team, very important for operation of uh, IBI based at the Kavli Foundation. So the phases of IBI, preparations leading to the formation of the organization, a documentation phase where all the different things need to be developed, integrating, bringing the components together and deploying, bringing the resources into action, harvesting concrete outputs and seeing future outcomes. So where are we? If you look at the past, the preparation phase led up to a declaration of intent to establish the IBI and Action is also earlier uh, at the United Nations level, but now we are further down on that, this list. And there we come into our working groups. There are five of them at this point in time. The global neuroethics has been around for a long time and have, has delivered a number of outputs. As you can see, there are four of the groups. And today we will focus on the data standards and sharing working group they are producing various type of outputs and they these outputs should then speak to the aspirational goals of the IBI. So let's take a look at those goals. For example, promoting coordination and leadership in the area, for example, making data collections usable and accessible and other comparable areas. Transcending borders, for example, at level of collaboration, what can be done in addition to what the individual brain initiatives will do on their own. Sharing and disseminating knowledge, 
for example, how could the working group contribute to making global data sharing easier? Shaping the future, for example, transdisciplinary training, what can be done in addition to what individual initiatives will do on their own? If you want to hear more about the International Brain Initiative, you might want to look at uh, an article in Neuron from January 2020. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, uh, then uh, let us start the introduction uh, of uh, IPI Data Standards and Sharing Working Group. Okay, let me uh, share uh, my uh, slides. Okay, so uh, uh, the first, the aim of the IBI data standard sharing working group uh, the, uh, with the uh, seven countries and the regions, the uh, international brain initiatives are going to produce uh, a lot of data of uh, different kinds uh, from animals and humans, on anatomy and physiology, uh, genomics, and so on. And then uh, uh, how we can best utilize these data within uh, each initiative or across uh, different initiatives or even outside of the brain initiatives, that is the uh, important issue. For that, uh, as you know, the FAIR principle are very important, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And the strategy uh, committee of IEBI uh, decided to form a working group for that with the mandates of uh, gathering data governance management policies and uh, goals, uh, and then defining common uh, interests in, uh, and needs, uh, and then uh, recommend uh, uh, up to three uh, potential projects and uh, make a, a white paper. So uh, our activity started uh, in uh, January uh, last year in Tokyo with the round table. This was right before the coronavirus spread started, so we could actually meet and uh, have an intensive uh, discussion. And uh, since then, the working group and the three tax forces are formulated, and the entire working group met the bi-monthly uh, online for goal setting and uh, pro making project proposals. And uh, uh, three task forces on white paper, data catalog, and uh, training uh, met uh, monthly uh, online and also uh, uh, worked on uh, in each activity. So, and uh, IBI has a, a so called uh, a project uh, a proposal pipeline to uh, bring ideas into actual uh, activities. Right? So, uh, and we have uh, proposed. Uh, uh, one uh, proposal uh, consisting of three subparts. First, about uh, data governance to establish a common data governance standard uh, and then uh, have a mechanism of endorsing uh, data managing plans of a different uh, uh, research proposals. And uh, for data cataloging, cataloging, we are going to uh, produce a search engine uh, across uh, multiple uh, brain initiatives uh, and also uh, potentially co develop data portal sites used, can be used for different uh, brain initiatives. And for training site, so uh, we are going to produce a, a web portal uh, about a pre uh, training uh, events, uh, possibly uh, by utilizing uh, INCF infrastructure, and then uh, start a train the trainer program, uh, and uh, also uh, start a competition hackathon to promote uh, data usage. So this uh, proposal uh, is now under evaluation by the strategy committee and the funders and uh, the other uh, collectives of uh, stakeholders. Okay, so, uh, and uh, with this uh, brief introduction, uh, I would like to uh, uh, call uh, keynote speakers, uh, Ken Harris and the Chris Ken Harris to start their uh, lectures. Thank you. So, uh... I'm here to uh, represent the International Brain Lab uh, and, the, uh, and tell you about the, the data architecture we've done uh, for this project. So the um, International Brain Lab, uh, as you see here in this um, also lovely uh, blast from the past view of a, a, a physical meeting we had a couple of years ago in Paris, is um, 
This is a, a group of 22 labs, half experimental, half theoretical, who are working together to understand uh, decision making. Uh, we're not from one of these national uh, 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 programs, we're an international um, collaboration uh, funded uh, by two uh, private charities, uh, the, the Wellcome Trust and the Simons Foundation, to whom we're very grateful for letting us uh, do this, uh, you know, new, new sort of uh, and, and fairly risky uh, project. Um, so uh, the, the, the thing we're doing is all of the experimental labs are recording uh, from different parts of the brain in the same behavioral task. The behavioral task is um, described in uh, this paper here. I think it's just come out in eLife. If it hasn't, it will do soon. Uh, uh, basically what happens is mice sit in front of a, a, a video screen, a stimulus appears on the right or the left, and they need to turn a wheel uh, in uh, one direction or the other to indicate which side of the stimulus, which side of the screen have the stimulus. And um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the stimuli also come in blocks. So there, um, there's a, a, in one block, there's an 80% chance of it being on the left. The other block, there's an 80% chance of it being on the right. And it switches between the two. Um, so uh, the, the, the mice have to learn not to, to estimate which block they're in. They get very good at this task. Here you see an example from one mice. And here you see the averages over the um, seven labs, which shows that the data is consistent. Uh, between the seven labs. So, and this is actually a new thing. The fact that you're able to get consistent experimental data from multiple labs working on the same task across different continents is itself an achievement. Uh, and that's what's described in this paper. I should say one other thing, which is that the um, postdocs and other researchers uh, in the project, as well as um, contributing to this global data set of recordings, they all have their own individual projects where they can use whatever recording modality they like um, to, uh, to uh, answer their own questions of interest and have their own uh, first author study. Um, uh, but uh, the, the, the other part of the um, project is to record a brain-wide map. So everybody contributes to the brain-wide map as well as their own personal projects. And you can see here the planned uh, electrode insertions uh, for the brain wide map um, here in a 3D uh, view. And here uh, you're seeing the top view of the different uh, insertion locations. Um, we're really planning to cover the whole brain uh, recording with neuropixels electrodes, which as I expect you know are these electrodes with the thousand uh, recording sites. Um, you, you might wonder why it's the left hemisphere here and the right hemisphere here. Uh, th the point is that the cortex generally tends to respond to stimuli or actions on the contralateral side, but the cerebellum on the ipsilateral side. So that's why it flips here, because we're interested in the same side of the, 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 the brain uh, viewed from the, the outside, so to speak. Um, so, so that's the data we're gonna collect. We're gonna, we've got this one behavior task, we're gonna record um, uh, activity from all over the brain uh, while uh, mice are doing that uh, in, in lots of different labs around the world. So this is a big challenge for data integration. And um, I think those, those FAIR principles that uh, Kenji mentioned are very appropriate here. So what we need to do is get first all of the data together in a single location and make it searchable. That's really important that it's searchable because there's so much data. Uh, and, and so we collect all of the data together, that's metadata, data about the, uh, about the subjects, their genotype, etc., data about the behavioral performance, the electrophysiology data, and all sorts of other recordings, such as the behavioral video, which is extremely important to have, um, uh, probe track localization from the electrodes, um, uh, which is histology, it's, it's um, still image data, and then other sorts of data like um, we have an ambient sensor uh, that measures the temperature and humidity uh, in the rig, et cetera. Then there's all sorts of pre-processing we need to do, um, such as spike sorting, uh, video tracking, uh, and analysis of the behavioral data from the, the, the wheel they turn, the other sensors, et cetera. And all of this is done with custom software. We need to define quality control metrics that say um, whether your electrophysiology, your video is good enough for, for public release and for use. 
uh, and also that the behavioral performance is good enough. And, and of course, we need to make the data searchable, uh, both for immediate access within the collaboration before it's been curated, but then also for users outside the collaboration once we've curated and shared the data publicly. Um, so this is a large scale project and you know, all of us came from individual labs and we've never worked on something this big before. And so the, the specific challenges of the project like this are very different to what you face in an individual lab. So particularly the data is messy. You know, there's always something in one lab that's a bit different to something in, in, in another lab. And if you have software that works 99% of the time, that's not good enough. It needs to work 99.999% of the time. And most of the data that you, most of the data software that you have in neuroscience, for example, for spike sorting, just hasn't been debugged to this level um, of performance and it doesn't have unit tests, et cetera. So a lot of what we've been doing involves rewriting code that was already uh, written. And, and of course, like in any project, uh, there are unexpected uh, issues, for example, to do synchronization of recording devices, except now we have it on a much larger scale because so many labs are running uh, this stuff together. Um, okay, fortunately, uh, we have an absolutely outstanding uh, team of, of really good um, scientists and, and engineers who are working uh, on this project. This is, in a way, this is the data architecture team because it includes most of the people who are working on the data side of things, but it's really very hard to um, divide people into, into groups who's working on what, because everybody contributes to everything uh, really in, in, in some way or another. Uh, but but these, are, these are, if you like, the core members of the data team who, who've really got this very difficult problem to work. Um, all right, so our goals in the data team are to first solve the specific problems of our collaboration, which is to collect and standardize the data and metadata, integrate across labs, perform these pipeline analyses uh, and uh, allow flexible data access. And then of course, as well as solving our own problems, in, in the process of developing these tools, we found things that uh, software and, and conventions that can be useful to the community. So that's individual single labs. So even though what we're doing is designed for a large collaboration, a lot of what we've developed is being now used in individual single labs as well as other collaborations, small and large. I think that the, the tools uh, and, and experience we've developed could, could be useful to inform those other collaborations. Um, okay, so here's an overview of how the system works. The, it, it's in a sense in four modules. Um, the first module is for data management within a lab. Um, so, uh, and that involves the metadata um, which is collected first by uh, individuals, such as, for example, if a genotyping result comes in, somebody types into a web form uh, what the genotype is, and that's put into a database, but also it's automatically collected. So um, the, the computer that runs the experiments um, saves uh, information to the database automatically, uh, as well as saving the uh, raw files to a computer. And importantly, there's a record of the data files in the relational database, which means that they can then be automatically processed. The next thing is to upload this uh, to a central server. We then have a protocol uh, that allows this data to be accessed. Uh, pipeline analyses are performed to populate a website, and then the data is made available to the user. And I'm gonna go through each of these steps now in a bit of detail. So the first step is the within lab data management. Uh, we, we need to maintain the metadata uh, and the bulk data. Uh, and so the, the metadata um, is collected in a relational database and it has the name Alex with a Y for reasons that are uh, lost, I'm afraid, in the midst of time. No one, I think, remembers anymore how it got that name. Um, and the table uh, design of this database allows um, colony management uh, of, of the, the, the mouse colony, electronic lab notebook features. So when you're doing an experiment, you can you know, type in anything that uh, you needed to do in the experiment, it's entered in the database. Uh, and, and it's got some features specifically for neurophysiology data, such as things like probe uh, insertion uh, trajectories. Um, 
And, and this database is something that's also used now in individual neurophysiology labs, because it doesn't need to be for a collaboration, but it's designed so that individual labs can easily join a collaboration. There's a web interface using Django uh, for manual uh, data entry, for example, birth date, genotype, housing info. And there's a REST interface that allows any computer program to interface with the database. And, and that means that, for example, that when you weigh one of the mice, the um, scales can talk directly to the database and enter the weight. Water delivery and behavioral performance, et cetera, can all be entered automatically into the um, database. And, and we use this in our lab for, for work beyond the IBL and several other labs uh, who aren't even members of IBL are now using this system as well, because it's just a nice uh, tool to have to keep track of the data and metadata in the neurophysiology lab. Um, the next thing is the bulk data, and that needs to be pre-processed. Uh, and uh, one of the, actually the, the, the biggest thing, things we've developed here is this very simple algorithm for lossless compression of EFIS data. And it's really simple. You take a first difference and then uh, compress with Zlib. Uh, but also it's done blockwise. And what this means is that you can get data from the middle of a file without uncompressing the file. So basically you store your compressed electrophysiology data, saving three times storage, and then you can still access it with random access to get data out of the middle. Um, importantly, all of the data is verified and uncompressed before uploading, because the last thing we want to do is think we compress the data and, and then realize there was a bug and it's lost. Um, for video, uh, it's, um, it's lossy compression using MPEG. And uh, then there's all sorts of other pre-processing that needs to be done. Uh, spike sorting, for the moment, we're using killer sort, but we're actually doing a lot of uh, development of killer sort uh, in order to make it run at scale. Video analysis, uh, we're running deep lab cut, and then all sorts of um, uh, synchronization and file extraction that's custom to our, our particular uh, setups. Um, another thing that, that recently we've developed is a distributed processing architecture. So the point is because all of the um, uh, individual uh, data from all the labs is stored on a, on a common uh, server, it says Flatiron because those are the people who very kindly uh, gave us a server, the Flatiron Institute in New York. Um, we, we're able to uh, now have a system that in computers in the individual labs um, uh, download data and, and perform processing on it, such as spike sorting, and then re-upload the results. So this is saving us a huge amount of money on a cloud computing cost, because we because we have these individual labs with their individual uh, computing nodes, it saves us money on cloud costs. Um, all right, so, so the next step is integrating the data on a central server. So um, automatic upload of data runs nightly. Um, for, for metadata, this is done by SQL merging, but actually uh, most labs actually run off the same database server, uh, which is on an Amazon host. So that means it doesn't even need to be merged. Um, for bulk data, uh, the, the electrophysiology files, etc., we use Globus, uh, which is a nice system for high bandwidth um, transmission with automated restarts and is controlled by the central uh, database. And, and the way it works is that for every file that was recorded, it has an entry in the database for the abstract file, but then also a record for every physical copy. So we know when a, a file is on a local server and we know when it's been transferred to the central server. Um, once the data is centralized, it needs to be made accessible to um, people within and without the collaboration. And this is done using a protocol we've developed called ONE, which stands for Open Neurophysiology environment, and it's a simple low-level interface to get to the data. Um, the way it works in short, um, every experiment has an experiment ID, which is a, a, a UUID. It's a, it's a string such as this one that uniquely defines uh, an experiment. And within that experiment, you have a whole lot of data sets. And the data sets are defined uh, by two-part names. So for example, spikes.times is the times of the spikes in a particular uh, recording. Spikes.clusters is the spike sorting clusters those were assigned to. And there's a convention that there's always a one-to-one -one, uh, correspondence 
between two files that have the same first part called the object, um, there's, they always have the same number of rows and there's a direct correspondence between the rows. Um, you can have another data set called clusters.depths that would tell you the depth in the brain of each of these clusters. And, and again, when there's a, a common name between here, it tells you there's a link between the two. So it's sort of like a relational model encoded in, in these arrays. Um, and, and here's an example of the uh, ONA interface. You define the data set types you want to load. Uh, you define your EID and then it's just a one line command to load these three uh, data sets uh, into arrays in, in Python or MATLAB. And the data is downloaded if required and it, they're also cached on the local machine. Uh, and, and so this is a simple protocol that allows you, anyone to access uh, data. Um, there's a few more complications. So for example, sometimes you have multiple copies of a data set. Uh, if you're doing recordings with multiple probes, you want spikes at times for all of those probes. If you have multiple spike sortings, you want uh, multiple versions of that for the different spike sortings. And that's extended um, by uh, having these, um, uh, you know, hierarchical uh, names, which are the files are just literally stored in subdirectories and the data set uh, names have this hierarchical structure. Um, Another important thing is that the data is constantly being revised. So for example, if we have a new version of the video tracking algorithm, we wanna upload the improved uh, video tracking. But at the same time, some users might wanna use an older version. Uh, for example, if they're revising a paper, uh, they wanna make sure they're using the same data while they're working on the same paper. They don't want it to keep changing underneath them. So there's a revision field in the database that says what version of the file is stored. So we keep the old versions as well as the new versions. Uh, they're physically stored in subdirectories on the server. And there's another field, the tag, that identifies all the data sets uh, released with a particular data release or, or paper. Um, the next thing is, is pipeline analysis that, that feeds onto a, a, a website. So this uses a system called DataJoint. Uh, DataJoint uh, is a company that we've uh, subcontracted with to do this work. And, and DataJoint is a system that does pipeline automated analyses on a relational database. And in our case, we're using this to produce and automatically update a website. And we use this first for, for tracking things like training within the collaboration. And we also have a public uh, demo already running. Uh, at the moment, it's got uh, behavioral data because we're just still just debugging the physiology, electrophysiology data, uh, but that's uh, now in progress. So I'll show you uh, this. Uh, this is a view of the website. So the, here you have a selection of um, uh, experiments you could choose from. We just selected one by clicking on it, uh, and now we've got the, uh, the, uh, the 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 home page for that data set. You can see the behavioral performance, the psychometric curve. Uh, for that uh, particular subject on that particular day, it was in this lab, et cetera. Um, uh, we've got data on the reaction time and the uh, reaction time is a function of trial number. If we scroll down, we get to the neurophysiology data. This lets you select a cell that was recorded by clicking on um, this scatter plot, giving us, in this case, firing rate versus depth. And we select a particular cell and we can see now a raster uh, plot and peristimulus time histogram, you have options to sort these uh, by different means. So for example, we're seeing uh, the uh, raster triggered uh, aligned to stimulus onset uh, with the trials sorted by stimulus contrast. Uh, and, 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 and by clicking through all these different raster plots, you get a very good feeling for what different cells in different parts of the brain are doing. Uh, and, and quickly over here, you can select different data sets. Etc. So this this website we think is going to be a really uh, useful tool uh, to um, now. Why is it no longer full screen? Um, to uh, let us ah, what's going on? To to let us um, interrogate the data and understand what's going on uh, uh, very quickly. I'm sorry, it went out of full screen. I need to go back to uh, presenter mode. Just give me one second. It shouldn't take long dangers of a live uh, presentation. Okay, great. 
so, um, yeah, so the final thing is making data accessible uh, to the user. So, and different people like to work in different ways. And our experience with the users within the collaboration is that they are old school and nearly everybody likes to download files and analyze them on their computer uh, just as they did in the old days. So we make that possible. The users can download the native ONE formatted uh, files like spikes.times.npy because it's stored in NPY format and analyze them on their computer using the old fashioned way. We also allow uh, the ONE interface, um, which is what you saw a clip of uh, earlier. Um, uh, and, and as I said, this downloads the files to a cache directory. So you can then work offline, uh, but if you haven't yet downloaded it, it automatically downloads it. And we, th we think this is a nice uh, way of working uh, with the remote data in a way that's familiar to people who just prefer to work in files. Uh, for those who are more moving with the times, um, their data can be downloaded in NWB format, the Neurodata Without Borders uh, format, which um, is a, a, a standard uh, for, for multiple projects. And also it'll be possible to access it via data joint. Um, the system that runs a website can also be used uh, to do custom analyses. And just to give you one example of the sort of thing you can do with this sort of data, uh, something we were curious about is uh, forgetting about the physiology even, what, what is it that makes the, the, some mice take months to learn, others learn within a week or two. What is it that's different? So um, we have all of this metadata, including things you wouldn't think about like temperature, air pressure, water regime, food protein content, etc. And um, which of those uh, is it that makes a difference to, that predicts how quickly they're going to learn? So Inesh Laranjera uh, in Lisbon uh, did this analysis where she put loads of these um, uh, data items into a random forest classifier and found that actually the thing that predicts best how long they're going to take to learn is just the performance change over the first few days. So if you know after a few days whether they've learned the task, that'll predict how quickly they're gonna get it. And this gives us strategies for how to optimize training moving forwards. So to summarize, uh, we've developed this uh, modular data architecture that allows organization of data within a lab, integration of data from multiple labs, flexible access to the data while the project is still being uh, developed, pipeline analysis and the display on an interactive website, um, and multiple data access methods. The modules can be used by individual labs or by large or small collaborations. And of course, we continue to develop them for our own purposes. Um, so that's what I'd like to say. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for letting me do a live presentation, which I hope went fairly smoothly. Uh, and, and thanks, of course, to our very uh, generous funders. All right. I wanna thank the ICNF and the Neuroinformatics Assembly for inviting me to talk to you about some of our work today. The question was posed as to what is the key to fruitful sharing of data? And I would say the answer is fruitful data. The strategies for sharing fruitful data, fruitfully sharing data, really are listed here. Start local, add collaborators to test data quality, share via reliable sites, keep your data current, add data that you find to be reliable to new upgraded analysis pipelines, and finally, return frequently to data and retest value in answering new questions. Of course, part of the problem will be having sufficient funding to maintain all of these aspects. And I'll tell you a little bit about our recent Neuronext funding. I wanna show you some examples from the sharing of hippocampal synapses. The hippocampus, of course, has these large pyramidal cells here visualized in a light microscopy in a Golgi preparation. And you can see the neuronal cell body, the dendrites, and at pretty high light microscopy um, visualization, you can see these dendrites are studded with dendritic spines, which I have now studied for more than 40 years when I wrote about recently in a, uh, the Journal of Neuroscience. In fact, this picture made the cover. It was the frontispiece piece of my PhD thesis. It goes back a long time. So to the data. So here now are synapses 
on one of these dendritic spines in the EM. And you can see that, in fact, there are two synapses in this image. And it makes it a lot easier to understand this image if we color code it. So this is one micron. This is the dendrite proper. Here's a mitochondrion. Here's the dendritic spine. Here is the spine apparatus, which occurs in about 10% of spines. We'll come back to talk more about them. Now, the synapse has a presynaptic partner filled with round vesicles, in this case, a glutamatergic synapse from an adult rat. The postsynaptic density has been outlined in um, red, where the synapse is located. This is the site of receptors and about 700 other or more proteins involved in translation of information coming from the presynaptic axon. And the synapse really is a tripartite synapse. There's perisynaptic astroglia, which influence the size and locations of different synapses. From this single section, of course, though, you can't tell that these two synapses, in fact, are neighbors on the same dendrite, where one of them has this large spine apparatus, the other has no smooth endoplasmic reticulum at all. The presynaptic boutons are filled with round, clear vesicles, and the size of the synapse is perfectly correlated with the number of presynaptic vesicles. And synapses that have larger, that are larger and have more vesicles are also more likely to contain uh, mitochondrion presynaptically. Many years ago, when John Fiala was in the lab, he created a program referred to as Reconstruct that has given us the possibility to reconstruct dendrites in the context and reveal synapses in the context of the surrounding neuropil in some detail. Joe Spachek, when he joined the lab back uh, quite a long time ago, but not as early as this tissue was perfused, and I, over many years, completely reconstructed every process in this volume so that we could share the data with others. But the first paper that was published from this animal was in 1989, actually a paper that's used a lot these days to study um, the, uh, to model dendritic spines. We looked independently at the SER, at the astroglia, at spinules that are involved in transendocytosis. It was shared with uh, Michislavsky to develop one of the first um, ultrastructural analysis of the hippocampal neural pill from a connectomics perspective to look at what determines where synapses are formed. We've studied the extracellular space in this volume. We've studied nascent zones in this volume and of course many other volumes. I'll tell you a little bit more about that story later. And um, most recently, a very famous paper now um, was used, this data was used uh, with information theory to determine how many bits of information synapses can store. And it's a lot more than one. They're not just on off. It's more like five in CA1. You can look at our website to find um, other papers on endosomes, slice artifacts, using this tissue volume from this animal that was perfused in 1984. And by 2015, um, the uh, field had advanced enough for us to be able to share this in an open environment uh, readily. And this work has now uh, resulted in more than 20 papers from outside our own individual collaborations. Curiously, if you look at this volume, it is equal to that of a single red blood cell, and yet it contains 500 synapses. You would have to repeat this reconstruction approximately 8 trillion times for one human brain, which has a much larger volume, of course. And with current methods, that would in fact take 8 trillion years of human labor. Well, in the meantime, we've devised unbiased approaches to perform experiments on learning and memory within our lifetime. And today I'm gonna to tell you about the impact of local postsynaptic and presynaptic resources on synaptic plasticity. In memory and tribute to a woman who really helped to launch my career when she was a postdoc in my laboratory several years ago. Jennifer Bourne unfortunately died tragically in a car accident on March 12th. And I must say, I'm still grieving at her loss. When Jen joined the lab, she employed some methods that Francis Jensen and I developed many years ago to be able to do time series 3DM after the induction of LTP. What that means is, is that we start by recovering a slice for about four hours, and then we record its baseline um, in response to control or um, con control test pulses. 
And then in one location in the slice, we deliver theta burst stimulation. In the other, we maintain the control test pulse stimulation. These slices can be fixed at multiple times following um, the uh, induction of LTP shown here physiologically as a rather robust increase in the response using microwave enhanced fixation at these key times, which produces really high quality images. From these images, from these slices, we use 3DEM from control versus LTP conditions here colorized as control stimulation um, tissue in the vicinity of the electrode that delivered test pulses only and LTP in the vicinity of uh, stimuli electrode that delivered theta bursting. Both were recorded as either um, independently as producing um, the stable baseline or potentiation. These regions were independently um, sectioned and um, imaged and reconstructed um, the dendrites at about 120 microns at a diagonal from these, the, the center of these independent um, sites of stimulation. And then we could measure synapses along this unbiased length from the beginning of the first protrusion to the beginning of the last protrusion. We measure synapse areas and density, for example, number per micron length of dendrite. And what Jen found was that following theta burst stimulation, this time we're looking at two hours after LTP, there were fewer but larger synapses on the dendrites that had undergone LTP than on those that had only received test pulse stimulation. Nevertheless, if you summed up the total synaptic surface area in the LTP and control condition and looked at five minutes per at five minutes after theta burst or control stimulation for 30 minutes or two hours later, you see that the summed PSD area squared per micron length of dendrite remained constant. And this homeostatic balance was achieved because LTP actually stalls the normal control-related recovery in small spine outgrowth relative to perfusion fixed brain um, that normally happens over the time course of two hours of control stimulation. LTP prevents this outgrowth of new small spines. Therefore, you have room for enlargement of the remain of the uh, large spines that. Um, are present in the neuropil. We look then at the um, impact of the local resource of smooth endoplasmic reticulum on this uh, process of synapse enlargement. Now, the majority of spines in hippocampal area CA1 in the adult contain no smooth endoplasmic reticulum, though it is present at the base in the dendritic shaft, colorized in green here, and you can see in the 3D here. Some spines have just a single tubule of smooth endoplasmic reticulum, while others form this elaborate spine apparatus that has features very characteristic of the Golgi apparatus, like uh, the bunning off of vesicles from the edges of it. Sometimes one does see polyribosomes attached to it. But only about 12% of spines contain either a tubule or a spine apparatus um, following LTP, and that frequency doesn't change. But what does change is, that following LTP, a much greater percentage of the SCR containing spines now have one of these Golgi-like spine apparatuses. We also looked at local protein synthesis as evidenced by a polyribosome in a spine um, head. This was work done um, during his PhD um, in our laboratory. Michael Chirillo was one of the mentees of Jen Bourne. And you can see the 3D here, the polyribosome. And what one sees is that following LTP, there's a tendency for there to be few, fewer polyribosomes. However, in neither case um, is their frequency very high amongst dendritic spines. But what we found when we start to look at this resource dependent um, enhancement of synapse enlargement is that if you have neither polyribosomes nor SER, you see about a 0.6% growth across synapses of all sizes following LTP. It's extremely rare to find both polyribosomes and SER in the same spine, so it wasn't possible to test whether or not there was a significant difference here. However, if we now look at those spines that contained only polyribosomes, you see a 4% growth. And furthermore, if you see those spines that contain only SER, which was now more likely to have a spine apparatus, you see, in fact, 
a very pronounced 11% increase in synapse size over spines of all sizes. Now, if you look at these dendrites, you see that there's a very non-uniform spine density along these dendrites. You have regions where spine density is very high and regions where it's low. And we're wondering whether or not this um, means that there are spine clusters that act independent of one another. So we looked at this by separating the dendrites into asynaptic and synaptic clusters with overlapping regions of spine origins. And we found that the spine outgrowth was only stalled in um, resource poor clusters, whereas in resource rich clusters where synapses uh, were markedly enlarged, they also shared these resources with their neighboring spines and they can encourage the same amount of spine outgrowth as was seen under control conditions. Now, when Beth Bell joined the lab, she went back to this Born Legacy data to look at another question. And that is, we saw the full LTP at by five minutes and 30 minutes after induction of LTP, but there was no synapse enlargement by there. In fact, we didn't see that until the two hour time point. And so this potentiation is stable. So that synapse enlargement must in fact be silent. Beth went looking for uh, morphological correlates of this silent synapse. And she looked at the different parts of the postsynaptic density. And typically what one sees at the active zone where vesicles are docked at the presynaptic side, a nice thick postsynaptic density referred to as the active zone portion of the postsynaptic density across from the active zone with vesicles. Notice this is section number 72 of this series. If we just go five sections later, we find a perfectly good postsynaptic density with no presynaptic vesicles. We refer to this zone as a nascent zone. And in 3D, you can see there's several patches along this synapse when viewed from the side where there's no presynaptic vesicles. And when viewed from the top, also no presynaptic vesicles and patches of postsynaptic nascent zone. So Beth looked at uh, Jen's 30 minute data and found that the size of these nascent zones shrank by 30 minutes during LTP. And we hypothesize that this is due to the recruitment of presynaptic vesicles because there's no change in the total PSD area. And instead, what we see is growth in the active zone um, by the recruitment of these presynaptic vesicles. These nascent zones then silently grow the PSD by two hours after LTP. You can see that the size of the nascent zones has markedly increased by two hours. But we call this silent because there are no new presynaptic vesicles associated with this um, growth in the postsynaptic density. And it accounts for most of the growth of the postsynaptic density following LTP. So here's the hypothesis that was generated. That nascent zone conversion to active zone um, is done by recruiting vesicles. And this we could see at five minutes by the um, docking and recruitment of these small dense core vesicles that carry the presynaptic um, scaffolding proteins and often have a string of vesicles attached to them when they're in transport packets. They get recruited to the presynaptic bouton. By 30 minutes, these dense core vesicles have been released. Their number has gone back to practically zero. The active zone has enlarged and the nascent zones have decreased. By two hours, you still have this enlarged active zone, but you've also recruited new nascent zones. We say that at eight, eight theta bursts, we know it saturates LTP in this process. And by two hours after LTP, we hypothesize that these nascent zones allow one to see augmentation of LTP. So the silent nascent growth prepares the synapse for subsequent LTP and learning. And we, in fact, in other experiments have shown physiologically that you actually do need to wait about two hours before you can induce an augmentation of LTP induced by this saturating paradigm. We also have recently found that the local docked vesicle density actually increases and these tethering filaments that are attached to the presynaptic vesicles have shortened by all measures, whether it's the diagonal or the um, immediate um, angle coming down or the positioning of the um, attachment sites relative to the plasma membrane and these um, vesicle sites. 
So this leads us to believe that the vesicles are um, uh, in a position where they're more ready to release immediately following LTP and that this is where um, uh, the potentiation has occurred and makes it ready for sustaining the potentiation. However, we find also, and Jen and Michael found this in their paper and Heather took it up later in her paper, that there's a dramatic drop in the non-doc vesicles after LTP. The total doc vesicles also drop, but they're more congregated after LTP at the synapses in the very specific sites as, as we found recently in um, Jay Hoon's paper. Okay, so where have all these non-doc vesicles gone? You can see here that they're decreased over all sizes of synapses um, in following LTP. When Lindsay Kirk joined our lab, she decided, uh, as, I, as we say, she was voluntold by me to go looking for where this membrane from vesicle drop might have gone. And we hypothesized that it might have gone to um, the surface of enlarging presynaptic glutons that is readying them for further vesicle recruitment. So um, it seemed like a simple task, but it turned out it required substantial work in collaboration with Terry Sanowski and Tom Bartle and using new tools that were developed to actually accurately measure the surface area of the synaptic gluton. And what uh, Lindsay has uh, found is that if you calculate the bouton surface area based on control bouton area plus lost vesicle surface area for each size of um, non-doc vesicle pool, that the uh, amount of membrane from the vesicle drop actually exceeds the LTP-related bouton surface expansion. And we're now going after where have all those other no uh, other non-doc vesicles gone. There's evidence that they may be moving into um, the mitochondria or the endosomal compartments, and maybe even the neighboring um, interbutan regions, which also enlarge following LTP. So here's what we have begun to find by sharing locally and um, with our collaborators, the data from GenBorn. Postsynaptically, there's an enlargement balanced by stalled spine outgrowth, SER positive spines are greater than polyribosome containing spines alone and much greater than um, having neither resource present. The sequestered resources in spine clusters support local spine outgrowth. The absence of spine outgrowth in distant resource pore clusters um, leads to this homeostatic balance in um, total synaptic input. Presynaptically, vesicles fill existing nascent zones early. The mitochondria dependent, there's a mitochondria dependent drop in vesicles. Um, vesicle membrane enlarges bouton surface area, and dock vesicles are tethered closer to the active zone. Nascent zone addition prepares these synapses for subsequent learning. Now, we need new tools in the spirit of sharing data to actually test the impact and generality of these and other findings. Six questions um, are demanded of these new tools. Six cues. Quantity, we need larger fields. Quo, we need, tried, we need to be able to use the tried and true preparations. It needs to be quick, less time imaging, more time for the science. The quality, well, we're aiming for better, better axial resolution so we can distinguish um, pro, uh, processes that are really close to one another and objects that are very close to one another. It needs to be quantifiable and well calibrated. And it needs to be affordable for postdoc startups and cores. So we pitched these ideas to the National Science Foundation. We we're very lucky to obtain a neurotechnology hub for enhanced resolution from 3D EM analysis of synapses across brain regions and taxa. And the main goal of this work is to develop tomography on the scanning electron microscope operating in the transmission mode, which meets all of the cues. And we're well on our way to completing that process. Um, in uh, 2020, we also obtained a Neuronex 2 to enable the um, identification impact of synaptic weight in functional networks and use some of these new tools that we've developed under the auspices of the technology hub. Um, I'm the lead PI on this, and we have four um, in integrated research groups from across the world. Um, with uh, three, four outstanding leads helping in this work. 
Um, the overarching question is what constitutes synaptic weight? What role does it play in shaping neural circuits and how does it change during growth and plasticity? IRG1 is approaching this question from a molecular perspective and how it's manifested at defined synaptic states. IRG2 is looking at subcellular constituents and manifestations of synaptic states um, at many different levels. And this, I'm part of this team, but it's led by Mark Ellisman. Um, IRG3 is looking at ultrastructural motifs of synapses and neural circuits and applying some of what we learn at IRG1 and IRG2 to define what a uh, structural state um, different synapses may be in under different um, functional states and in different brain regions and even across different species. And the IRG4 is developing the cyber infrastructure to enable the multi-scale discovery in these diverse neural circuits. It's led uh, competently, of course, by Terry Sanowski and has many great people in the group um, to help really leverage the tools that we have and create the pipelines that will make it easier for us to share our data. And then we're doing this all under the auspices of the Texas Advanced Computing Center with the help of my dear colleague, James um, Carson, and creating this site where we have an interactive portal, we have a live link to capturing the EM images as they come off the microscope. We're developing and um, implementing in this environment the multiple 3DM analysis tools, and put, putting up high, online tutorials, and creating strategies to share the data, disseminate the data, and of course, more. So these are some of the strategies I told you about today for our fruitful sharing, but I wanna end by really emphasizing the need for having substantial grant funding in everybody's grants to have data scientists present so that we can uh, properly provide metadata and shared ontologies for the data that we are collecting and sharing. And with that, I'd like to thank my current lab, collaborators, former teams, and of course, the funding for this work. And thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Franco Pestilli, Associate Professor at the University of Texas, Austin. Today, I will be talking about the international data governance for neuroscience. This is an effort part of the IBI, specifically the Data Standards and Sharing Working Group. The working group uh, is goals are to facilitate discovery, harmonization, and use of data across the IBI participant and the rest of the world. Members and stakeholders of the group are brain initiative representative, scientists like me, as well as funders. The goals of the working group has been established in a round table in January 2020, and then in a meeting in February 2020. Primary goal are the, the publishing of a white paper proposing best practices and data governments uh, regulations across the uh, the international partner of IBI, uh, generate a, uh, a catalog of data sets and archives, as well as the establishing practices for education and training of scientists, uh, funders, and participants. So the data standards and sharing working group has been effectively divided into data cataloging uh, task force, a training and hackathon task force and a data government white paper task force. I am part of this uh, last and as we're speaking today uh, in regards to the progress done with the data government uh, task force. Uh, as a result of the work we've done with the group, we realized we have drafted a white paper and we have an advanced draft of the white paper. But as we were writing the white paper, we realized that there was a need for um, uh, making the case for international data governments for neuroscience. Indeed, as we were trying to learn about all the different initiatives, we realized that there wasn't clarity and there wasn't organization um, uh, sufficient for us to develop a full white paper that would describe how all the partner, in, in, uh, partner of the IBI can interact. As a result, we worked instead on developing an opinion and a set of recommendations for international data governance. What is international data governance and what are the goals of, the, of it? 
The idea is to lay the foundations for international sharing and governing of data in neuroscience. We also plan to make a recommendation on what parameters the IDG should cover and how it should be approached. More generally, what is data governance? Data governance has been defined as the overall management of the availability, usability, integrity, quality, and security of data in order to ensure that potential uh, of the data is maximized while the ethical and risks are minimized. There's a need for international data governments because neuroscience is changing. It's going global. It's going from local labs and institutions to global projects that often cross state as well as nation-wide borders. This is, for example, the map of the IBI members. In green are all the nations that are part of the IBI effort. And you can see that we span uh, most of the continents. Indeed, as Caroline Montoyo once said, it takes a war to, the world to understand the brain. And this is an effort that is global and is becoming more and more involving across nations. While uh, uh, the increase in uh, sharing of data uh, was initially seen as a challenge for neuroscientists, currently data availability has become a priority and sharing of neuroscience data is clearly established as a need for the community. There's multiple axes of, and reasons of why we have this need. One is the need to increase data size so that we can uh, support and feed the most current methods that might impact discoveries. For example, machine learning and artificial in intelligence are highly data uh, thirsty. At the same time, there's a need to uh, support reproducible research and openness and fairness. And this is, these are the two needs that have been promoting sharing of data. So for this, the requirements expectation for data management have also moved from a reluctant sharing to an open sharing. At the same time, because of the globality of the efforts and because of the changes in needs, we share in data, uh, a different perspective of the definition of neuroscience data also has emerged. Uh, early on, uh, the definition of neuroscience data focused primarily on measurements. Here is a re, uh, um, remake of a very famous uh, early picture uh, describing uh, a variety of data measurements from neuroscience uh, spanning the, the temporal scale on the x-axis and the spatial scale on the y-axis. Yet, a more modern definition of neuroscience doesn't stop on measurements. It actually needs, for reproducibility uh, uh, needs, needs to move to uh, comprehend also derived data, data that is produced using software and analysis from the original measurements, and then as well uh, comprehend also the software that uh, has to be accompanying the derived data. And this is a process that doesn't step, doesn't stop in the first step, actually goes on. And here we have a representation of how complex it is in modern days to uh, define and, um, and organize neuroscience data. There's challenges to sharing data internationally. These challenges are uh, rooted in different uh, critical aspects of the sharing uh, of data in neuroscience, but mostly due to the international nature of the process. As we've seen, the size and complexity and diversity of data is actually a primary, one of the primary challenges. But also there are regulations and policies that change across countries, and these also can pose challenges to researchers for sharing data. Ethics is actually a critical uh, challenge to sharing data. How do we know that the data would be used uh, not in a manipulative way in trying to control individuals? And also there are different core concepts and definitions in different, uh, in different uh, as, uh, 
parts of the, uh, the world. For example, the terms de-identification, anonymization, and pseudonymization are different, but often used uh, interchangeably. Language, there's different languages in different countries and that creates barriers for sharing the data, at least for what pertains understanding documentation and uh, principles and laws. Finally, there's a cultural diversity, uh, different culture uh, bring to the table of conversation, uh, different attitude and some of the cultures are more proactive than others, uh, but that doesn't mean that one culture it's better or uh, better sharing data or more willing to sharing data. Uh, these are all aspects that need to be uh, understood and worked around so that uh, international data sharing can be effective. Because of these challenges and risk, there's also risk associated with sharing data. Indeed, here is a graph that shows that Data access on the x-axis increases risks because of uh, all the challenges I just showed you before. The idea that we're proposing is that uh, if we have or establish an international data governance uh, framework, uh, we can uh, keep increasing data access while uh, maintaining risks at minimum. Another way to think about it is that every time a researcher has to share data or is willing or is, uh, uh, to try to share data, has to go through different types of requirements and regulatory oversight. Uh, there are uh, laws that depend on national and state laws. There's international treaties. There's institutional requirements, funder policies and requirements. There's project specific requirements, data archive requirements, and also journal requirements. All these requirements and laws can become a burden to the researcher, uh, especially in the lack of an international data governance framework that can help the researcher to streamline the process and to understand uh, what is needed to do and how. Indeed, the idea is that uh, by developing an international data government framework, uh, all these regulations and law can turn from a burden to actually useful stepping stone that can help the researcher uh, really stay on top of research and performing uh, at maximum the best cutting edge research uh, based on fair principle and sharing of data. What is international data governance? It's a responsible and holistic approach for all stages of the data life cycle. These, compre these comprehend collection, processing, curation, archiving, preservation, application, utilization, and sharing all the way to deletion. So IDG, the international data governance, will need to uh, oversight and suggest actions and operation at every level of this. The group and the task force had in, as part of the effort for uh, uh, defining the opinion papers has uh, produced a set of recommendations. Uh, the first recommendation is to develop principles for international data governments. This principle uh, should cover ethical, scientific, technical, legal funding as well as sharing requirements. Also, uh, we propose to make international data a priority. Commonly, it is not. Commonly, governance of data, it's often an afterthought that we learn as researchers and as funders after research is funded or after research is performed and data is collected. We propose the need to develop a streamlined data government guidance. Uh, lack of principle and regulation and tools can really impact research. So we need to develop a guidance document that can help uh, all the stakeholders to take actions. More specifically, we need practical tools uh, that can validate uh, projects and can validate methods and, uh, and uh, approaches to sharing data on a case by case basis. For example, sharing data between the US and Japan or sharing data between Germany and the UK, et cetera. 
Finally, we need to increase awareness and improve education on data governance. As I said, in, uh, as we uh, put a forth on point number two, uh, this has to become in the future, uh, something that everyone gets educated and understand uh, so uh, that uh, global science and global neuroscience across nations and states can happen more effectively. Thank you very much uh, for listening. I also would like to thank all the other participants to this group, Damian Ecke, Marianne Marton, Jan Viale, Oliver Rubel, Ricardo Chavarriga, Emmy Bernard, Agnes McMahon, Edda uh, Fields, and Kiji Toya. Thank you very much. I'm Sean Hill, Chair of the International Brain Initiative Data Catalog Task Force. The co-chair is Tom Johnston from the National Imaging Facility in Australia. Uh, below, you'll also see the names and affiliations of all the task force members who have really contributed to the work that you're seeing today. First, the IBI Data Catalog Task Force had as an objective to define a strategy for a sustainable data search capability to discover all of the data produced by the International Brain Initiatives. As inspiration, we really started with the Google Knowledge Graph, which have, as you know, is the basis of the most famous search engine, uh, most widely used search engine of our time. The Google Knowledge Graph contains a lot of information and of course the relationships between information. So when you search for the human brain, you find images of the human brain, you also find related concepts, and you find information, uh, articles, entries describing the brain. Now, Google has also built the Google Dataset Search, which enables a, a user to find data sets of interest. And the way that they do that is to encourage data set providers to fill out some basic metadata about those data sets. And in this case, it's something called structured data. So this is using a JSON-LD data snippet embedded within the web page that provides useful information. In this case, um, there's contact information for a business embedded within the website. The, the structure of that data, of that metadata, comes from schema.org, which has data type definitions data schemas for events, organizations, people, places, businesses, products, and so on, um, as well as data sets. And so we need to think of uh, how do we get that information about neuroscience data sets actually uh, populated into websites? And what are the incentives to do that? And of course, in the context of the IBI um, the, the interest is to make that data visible, searchable, and, and accessible to other scientists around the world. So the first thing we did was to review uh, all of the current brain initiative approaches to structuring their metadata, the Human Brain Project, eBrain's Knowledge Graph, the Blue Brain Project, Neuroshapes, Japan Brain Minds Data Portal, the Canadian Open Neuroscience Platform, the INCF Knowledge Space, the Distributed Archives for Neurophysiology Data Integration, and the Spark Data Structure. And one of the examples um, that really was, was fleshed out to, to the state that it could serve as a great working example for the IBI data catalog was the Brain Minds Data Portal. Um, Brain Minds is Japan's brain mapping project that was launched in 2014. But it's been primarily based at Riken, but it's been um, sponsored by uh, MX and AMED since 2015. The unique appeal of the Brain Minds project is its focus on the marmoset and on building marmoset brain atlases. And one of the key uh, products of Brain Minds that's on, available from their data portal is in fact the 3D marmoset reference brain atlas. And um, Alexander Woodward and his team that's responsible for the data portal uh, developed a, a, a schema, or they populated a schema from schema.org for the data set describing this, um, including information like the authorship, the license, where to access it, and a, and a data set description. 
for this atlas. They also developed some tools to generate uh, a data set landing page based on that metadata uh, so that that could be put up on their website um, in order for it to be searchable and indexable by other search engines. And now when you go and perform a Google data set search, you actually see the Brain Minds reference Brain Atlas and other data sets uh, available through Google data set search. However, there are some limitations of Google data set search. There's no guarantee that your data sets will be indexed or searchable. There's no API or application programming interface to build search engines on top of the, the Google Knowledge Graph. There's no support for neuroscience specific metadata. Um, for example, you know, you can describe entire data sets, but if you start to want to search um, within that or search for more neuroscience specific aspects, um, there's no support for that in Google data set search. On the other hand, uh, the INCF knowledge space, um, which is actually a community based encyclopedia, um, provides a search engine for neuroscience resources, including data, computational models, and literature. Um, it supports encyclopedia articles uh, with links to the related data, and it provides an API. Um, so it's, it's also got the semantics and links to, to standard ontologies or vocabularies for neuroscience concepts. And in this case, you can see a screenshot where there's an article about the thalamus, um, and in the data space panel to the right, there are links to the various computational models, morphology, anatomy, gene expression, physiology data from around the world. And because Brain Minds adopted a standard data model and worked closely with uh, INCF Knowledge Space team, um, their data sets are now searchable within the knowledge space. And in fact, the knowledge space now integrates a broad array of IBI data sources, um, including the Canadian Open Neuroscience Portal uh, data, as well as Dandy and, and Spark and, and, and others, including the eBrains Knowledge Graph. So these data now um, are searchable because of the work of the I INCF knowledge space to integrate those data sources based on um, some common metadata. So the next step is really to review these metadata and the mappings of the individual brain initiatives to the common metadata model, um, starting from, of course, the schema.org data set, to define a, an indexing strategy and a kind of a standard process for adding new data sources to the knowledge space, and to publish tutorials on how to do this yourself and to invite broader community review of the proposed standards. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and look forward to any feedback, uh, again, from the broader community on this process. Thanks to all. Hi, everyone. I'm Sharon Crook. And on behalf of the training task force of the Working Group for Data Standards and Sharing of the International Brain Initiative, I want to thank you very much for um, listening in on this introduction to some of our ongoing activities. So in this very short talk, I will talk a bit about the task force mission and our goals for achieving this mission. Um, I'll talk about recent progress, uh, what we've been working on so far, and our uh, planned future activities. This will provide an overview of our roadmap for moving forward, and I'll talk a little bit about what we hope the impact of these activities will be. So we all know how important data are um, to the neuroscience community, and they've become um, um, you know, much broader, heterogeneous. Um, and, um, and the great thing is that we have more and more resources sharing data. We have more and more um, software packages for analyzing data. Um, and many of these are coming out of the brain initiatives that are part of the International Brain Initiative. So our mission, um, is in line with the mission of the data standards and sharing work group. And that is we want to increase the impact of these data on science and health. And of course, for our task force, the way that we wanna achieve that is through training resources. And in particular, we're interested in promoting data standards, 
facilitating data sharing and providing guidance for obtaining these data sets and then analyzing them and using them in many different ways. So we have several goals for reaching this mission. So first of all, we want to um, help uh, develop training materials for um, the, the other initiatives within our working group, the other activities within our working group. So you just heard a lot about, um, you just heard about some really exciting things that are going on in the other task forces. And we want to help them create training materials to share um, the results of these activities. So the second thing is um, we recognize that within different brain initiatives in, um, in these member countries of the, of the International Brain Initiative, um, they're creating um, really important resources for data standards and data sharing. And of course, um, they all have their own training activities um, to share information and, and tutorials and things like that about um, their resources. Um, however, we, we all recognize that there are many workflows that are important that span multiple brain initiatives. And so our goal is to help create training activities, bring these people together um, uh, to network and collaborate and create training activities that span these different um, brain initiatives. Um, another area that we're interested in, uh, one of our further goals is this idea of train the trainer activities. So um, bringing together people from um, these different uh, member initiatives for training activities that then create experts that can go back to the member countries and uh, share information uh, about these different resources um, with people um, within their own communities. And then finally, we hope to share information about career paths that are related to data standards and data sharing. So our roadmap so far um, has focused on gathering information about the different resources um, that are being created within the different in, uh, brain initiatives um, in the IBI member countries. Um, and finding out more about their individual training activities, what they're doing to uh, reach out to communities and, um, and train them to use uh, the resources that they're developing. Um, we also have identified the INCF training space as um, a, a well-designed, widely used platform that is already um, uh, there and, and ready to help us share information associated with the training resources that we create um, in conjunction with the IBI website. And then finally, we've been working on um, developing some um, networking activities that promote collaboration across initiatives. Um, so for example, the IBI is partnering with Ebro, eBrains, and the INCF on a virtual masterclass in brain atlasing and simulation services. Um, this will be offered by the eBrains infrastructure and it's focused on Asia Pacific audiences. So this is just an example of the type of activity that we want to help um, uh, facilitate and promote. So over the next year or two, um, what we plan to do is um, continue to work on facilitating these um, network activities. Um, we also want to develop these uh, training resources that I described. Um, we want to uh, organize workshops that are like hackathons where we bring together people um, who represent different resources um, in these data workflows that span initiatives. And then based on the activities in those hackathons, we will develop um, curated shared spaces at the INCF training space um, that will also be um, integrated with the IBI website um, to share these sort of cross-cutting initiatives. And as I mentioned, we're planning to um, create some of these train the trainer activities and, 
and also identify other areas where um, we can help facilitate um, better impact um, of ongoing brain initiative um, activities and resources, particularly where um, it's important to collaborate and, and network. And so what we hope is that the impact of these activities will be that we can help um, these individual brain initiatives um, gain wider audiences for their events and resources. Um, and then of course, also we hope that this will increase the user bases for these different um, data uh, resources and, um, and then in turn create higher um, scientific impact um, on the community. Okay, so lastly, I would like to recognize the um, training task force members um, who come from um, many different brain initiatives and, uh, and related um, um, affiliations. And in particular, I want to uh, thank the co-chair of the task force, uh, Tina Koken. Thank you very much for listening. Yes, thank you very much uh, for the uh, keynote speakers uh, and the three uh, task force leaders for their presentations. Right, so I'm uh, Kenji Doya, uh, coming back, uh, 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 co-chair uh, for this uh, working group. So I'm very glad that uh, we have a wider uh, participation than our usual working activity at the opportunity of this uh, INCF meeting. Right. So in the remaining uh, uh, about uh, 30 minutes, we want to have a discussion uh, about uh, uh, what uh, uh, we really need to further facilitate uh, data sharing and usage and uh, what uh, we can do, especially this uh, IBI working group uh, can do. Right? Uh, but before that, uh, maybe there are uh, many questions uh, regarding the keynote talks. Uh, I found it very interesting. So uh, uh, while Christian uh, uh, Harris uh, uh, pointed out the uh, importance of starting local uh, to, uh, for specific questions and the gradually increased uh, uh, collaboration, whereas the, uh, Ken Harris presented. So uh, from, the, from, the, from the beginning, uh, think of a scalability and the organization and then uh, uh, in in a uh, uh, worldwide uh, uh, framework uh, to start up, so uh, and uh, there has been have been already uh, quite a few uh, uh, questions uh, in the uh, chat box, and uh, I think uh, uh, Ken uh, has already seen many of them, and then uh, he, you typed uh, some of the uh, the answers already. But uh, could you uh, pick some of those uh, questions? Uh, and then the answer uh, uh, by your words, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks. So, so first thing I'd like to say, actually in, in response to what you just mentioned, Christian's point about starting local, mm -hmm. I, I don't see what we did as being any different to that. Actually, I'd say it's exactly the same because you know, even though it's a larger project, we're, we're not trying to solve everybody's problem. We're trying to solve our problem. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we're able to do this, um, you, you know, that, that we're not trying to solve everybody's problem makes it just a lot easier. So for example, we've made some quite big changes fairly late in the day to the extent that if anybody was using our standards when we did that, it would have totally screwed them up. But because we, we, we're only trying to solve our problem, um, we, we're keeping it um, internal. And I think that, that this is what the field's gonna need to do. We're gonna need to have many different projects that individually solve their own problems. And then eventually what we've all learned will allow it to, to bring together. That said, of course, we were thinking ahead to something that hopefully will scale up and, and become usable by the worldwide community. And, and so far, I think, there isn't a huge reason to think that's not going to work. So, so in regards to some of the, the specific questions, um, so from, from, from Zach, um, 
is it possible that um, this would be uh, usable uh, by a wide variety of neural interfacing and imaging modalities, animal models, application scenarios, experimental paradigms, etc. Okay, so I hope so. Um, and, and remember, it's a modular architecture, so different modules will be suitable for different um, projects. So, so the, the first module is the within lab um, data organization, which is based around this um, colony management and electronic lab notebook software. So I, I do think that will be suitable for any lab that's doing um, in vivo neurophysiology, because those are currently the labs that are doing it. I think it could be in any species. Human is, is a different category because there's all the need for synonymization. But for, for, for animals, I think this probably would work for any animal species. And in fact, there are labs using it that work on a wide variety of species. For other types of data, such as you know electron microscopy or, or what have you, I'm not sure if it would be as suitable. It could certainly be extended to, to work with that. But, you know, because it was designed for neurophysiology, there would need to be some extensions for it. So that's the, the first module. The second module is, is the one about data integration uh, and sharing via the open neurophysiology environment. Um, and the way that was designed, um, the, the, the one thing that we think no, nobody is going to use a, a data standard if they need to ask a central committee uh, for permission every time they're going to save a file, right? So one of the things about it is that anybody can extend it anytime they want, but when they do that, they, there's a, a, a system where you put in a prefix. So the, the first name of your file is something like, you know, your file is called something like spikes.times.mpy. If I want to invent a new one, I'll underscore it, uh, I'll prefix it with a uh, um, underscore Kenneth underscore spikes dot shapes, right? And then because I've prefixed it with that underscored word, everybody knows that it's mine and that it's not a global standard. So I can extend it whenever I want and I don't need to ask anyone's permission but it's also marked through the file name that that's my own uh, extension. Then, if um, if somebody uh, if this if somebody has an idea that's worth making a global thing, taking into the standardized uh, things without underscores, then uh, once that's agreed, that can happen. So, so that's uh, and and labs that are using this to release data now they all they all follow these uh, conventions. Um, so, so I hope with that convention, the open neurophysiology environment is something that could be useful actually beyond neurophysiology because there's nothing really, despite the name that's specific to neurophysiology uh, about it. Um, and then the, the, the other question was from uh, to, uh, Tom Gillespie, um, uh, which was, um, about, yeah, I think, I think the same, the same thing, basically, how, how, how do you, um, uh, what did it take to get all the member labs to agree on the data model? Did they need to come to some agreement or were they given the tool and then it was not updated to their needs as requirements became clear? So it, it, it's kind of both. The, the thing is, because we're not trying to solve everybody's problems, we have, um, you know, we, we designed something that works for this collaboration. We didn't think of everything. So when it became clear what we didn't think of, those are things that were added. Um, and, and for labs that want to use it, these tools for other things in this uh, collaboration, we're happy to help as, as we can. So we, we came up with something that works for the IBL project and then extend it as, as required. Um, last thing I should say uh, is that there's a couple of people from the project here, um, Niccolo Bonacci and Julia Huntenberg, who, who I think are on the main site and, and can also discuss this sort of stuff in more detail. Okay, yeah, thank you, Ken. Yeah. So, uh, and uh, for uh, Christian, uh, 
uh, did you find some uh, interesting questions or uh, any? Uh, well, comments? I, I, I just want to say that, um, you know, I really laud the effort of all of you and those who, and I know Marianne Martone has been a part of this effort since the beginning. I really view myself as an experimentalist and a user and a, not a very sophisticated database creator, I must confess. But I kind of find myself right now in the middle of it. And that's part of the reason why I wanted to present data, you know, literally was from one of the earliest animals I ever perfused. And it was great data and it keeps getting used. And so I, I suspect that there are a lot of experimentalists who have, you know, a boatload of really high quality data, right? that was really hard to get in the first place and has been really useful along the way, but they didn't, you know, you know, back in 1984, I wasn't thinking about database. You know, I had a, literally, I still have the notebooks that are paper in white file boxes that record the data. We take pictures of those and, you know, put them in the subdirectories as the data goes forward. So, you know, there's this, there's this um, um, tension and from the point of view of an experimentalist, there's always this tension between just getting started on the next experiment and making sure that the people who are working on the next experiment collect enough metadata that 20 years from now, because I am using 40 year old data that there was enough metadata that I feel like I can still use that data, right? But as you go forward, you know, I really do think that as we start to try to share unplanned sharing, so, so this is the question, you know, there's, there is a question, are we going to dig deep backwards or are we going to require everybody to say, okay, start fresh and move forward with, um, you know, a high level of expectation that you're going to always create data that the rest of the world's going to want. And I think there's another piece to the question too, and that is what data are you going to throw away? You know, if an image is six, if a, uh, each image is five gigabytes, there's a lot of data in there that can be mined. And if you didn't collect the data at high enough resolution, it's not going to be mineable to the next question. So this is a constant tension, right? In the field of connectomics, you know, what resolution are you going to collect at? At what time cost are you going to collect the data? And, you know, there's been this, uh, I'm, I'm going to have put in the chat here that I'm going to be giving an introduction to this series of workshops that have been going on through the brain connectivity. I put the link to the overall workshops into the chat. Um, this was uh, developed by the Brain Initiative at NIH and the Department of Energy, which are looking to figure out how to facilitate this kind of work, this the effort towards you know the future of of sharing um, connectomic style data, electron microscopy style data, um, and across different scales, and how how do we go about doing this in an efficient and a timely fashion so that it you know the 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 question is you know at what at what scale is it usable right away versus you know, thinking five years ahead or 10 years ahead, that when you're going to have a new question, if you'd collected the data at sufficient resolution, you wouldn't have to go back and have another big process of collection. So one of the things that I, I really want to revisit is this notion of CAP, complete, accurate, and permanent, right? And I, I think complete is certainly the wrong word. Um, I think it should be competitive, um, collaborative and cooperative, and those are at different levels, right? So you, you do competition for um, innovation, you do collaboration for seeing whether or not two tools can talk to each other, and then eventually, as Kenneth and others have been talking about today, you really need to have cooperation to agree, you know, how much of the diversity are you going to maintain in the different styles so that everybody's data can eventually be able to talk to each other. Accuracy, I don't think we ever get to give up that word. Accurate, it has to be accurate, right? But at what precision? So accuracy and precision are different, right? And so at what precision do we want to be accurate? And then finally, when you talk about permanent, I think that's just, and you guys are, you know, the, the case in point. I don't think permanent's ever going to be a word we can use for anything. I think we have to have it be public. 
shareable, extensible, dynamic, at all of neuroscience data. All, in fact, if, you know, you think about astronomers and physicists, you know, this has been kind of the message and it's very public and very shareable. So I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm giving you my introduction to the workshop that'll be on April 28th. I, I understand there's an overlapping workshop, but I think one of the interesting things that I saw from this whole conversation today that I thought was really uh, splendid is that it seems to me that there's an effort from both sides, you know, start with the mission like Kenneth did of, well, maybe that wasn't the mission, maybe it was very similar to our own, but really, you know, saying, okay, halt, let's get everybody on board and start sharing now from a particular project. We're all going to use the same electrodes. We're all going to use the same notebooks. We're going to see if we can make this work in a way. And, and really that's a, a mission from a data sharing point of view. Whereas I'm thinking of it as an experimentalist. And I think some of the, the stream that went along here is that you know one experiment is a 13 hour day and then I've got five years of data analysis, right? I, I, I don't really have, uh, you know, and, and, and to, Marianne does make a point, you know, in fact, this summer I'm gonna take R, I've always used statistical packages, right? <laughs> to do my data, but it'd be more efficient if I was really a Python coder and an R programmer, right? Uh, to, um, communicate with my data. But, you know, when I started, RS1 was the statistical package. Yes, I did line coding, but I wasn't a programmer, right? And so over the years, people have different skill sets that have, you know, that has a pretty steep learning curve to acquire a new skill. And the older you get, the harder it is to acquire that new skill. So one of the things that I brought up at the end of my talk, which I hope will percolate to the funding agencies, is that um, there's, there's two ways of funding data science. One is the data science project. And Franco, I was really pleased to see that, you know, we're gonna be starting, uh, um, well, we have some data science programs at UT and a lot of students are going, wait a minute, that's how I can make a living as opposed to <laughs> fighting for one of the six, uh, you know, one of the six, with 600 other people for one of the faculty positions, they're going to work with this. So there's that component to it. Um, but then there's, um, you know, training the neuroscientist, and Marianne, I think your point is really well taken too, training neuroscientists to design their experiments in such a way that at least they learn about DOI early in their career, or at least they learn about, you know, a level of data structure that's electronic, whether or not it's electronic notebooks or Jupyter or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, they learn about this as part of their career, but to demand them to be sophisticated data scientists, in addition to being sophisticated experimentalists would be, you know, outside the purview of any one human brain. So I think developing these, developing tools and, and training that, you um, makes it really easy for the professors who are overseeing the work to, to point to it and for the students and the next generation of neuroscientists as well as us old folks, we're not dead yet. <laughs> I wanna keep being able to give back. So I'll, I'll turn it, I know we have some uh, time left and I, I've talked way too much. Just a, just a follow up point to that, I think in their little side discussion in Zoom is I think that the public data repositories are really the key to being able to have the, the as much as we can, the best of both worlds because data scientists are constantly looking for projects. They're looking for data. And a, long, a couple of years ago, NIF did a landscape analysis where we ran our entire anatomical ontology against all of the data sources that we had. And you saw real gaps. You saw there was a profusion of forebrain data because of uh, uh, MRI, right? There's a lot of forebrain structures. But uh, at the time we were engaging with uh, Adam Ferguson and his group on spinal cord, and you could see there was zero for spinal cord. There were no open access spinal cord data sets and uh, the open data comments for spinal cord injury was a response to that to say, we need to get more spinal cord injury data into the public domain. So I think that that is actually a very, very strong argument, right? For creating these large archives to make sure that there are data sets available and to work with the data scientists on domain problems that they can use in their uh, area to advance their careers, and we can use them in our areas to advance neuroscience. 
Yes, I was very impressed to hear that the decade-old data is actually helpful for today's cutting-edge research. So I think that kind of success story is better shared with the beginning neuroscience students so that they can understand the importance of keeping good metadata and the good data storage. Because I often find the difficulty reanalyzing the data from my own lab three or five years ago after a student leaves. So, Exactly. And also uh, keeping that uh, data in a public repository is a good way to make sure the data is well documented and the uh, location is clearly uh, mapped. Yes, I, I do want to also put in a plug because Christian, I actually mentioned your name uh, when I was um, uh, participating in a data sharing work group for, I think it was uh, Fens or Febs, I can't remember one of them. And you know the key of good data management inside of the laboratory as a means of both for your own personal use, your future use, your laboratory's use, and public use is really key. And I remember early on when you gave a presentation about how carefully in your lab everybody has to document that everybody is introduced into a culture of documentation when they join your lab uh, and down to the name way that you name the files and so on and so forth. And that really, I, you know, I said, if one does that, this issue of going between the private space and the public space becomes a matter of, well, yes, I may need to transform a format or I may need to document it so people can use it, but I have the metadata, I have the required documentation and I can find my files <laughs> more importantly, which is really critical. So I believe I, I, you know, I have my little aphorism is, you, know, you have to prepare to share fair. And part of that is data management inside the individual laboratories or a group of laboratories. If I can pitch in just a little bit, Kristen brought up a lot of interesting questions. One that struck me is the concept of uh, uh, data, data history and how long data is needed and useful. Not all data has the same lifespan. So I, I think uh, thinking about that, thinking about how we can identify in the, from the community perspective, from the researcher perspective, what data might be more likely to be useful for 10 years or 40 years versus what data may be just useful today and tomorrow. It's something that I haven't seen a lot of discussion going on yet, uh, but you know, some of the repository claiming that the data would be in perpetuity, it, it might be great, but also might not be necessary. So, so there's also the issue, there's a, a National Academy panel with, uh, that I was on to try to deal with data value. How do you predict data value? It turns out to be virtually impossible. <laughs> right? And you could have a data set that's not particularly interesting, but if it's well annotated, well structured and accessible, it will get reused over and over and over and over again versus something that's fabulous, but it was required and structured and documented so poorly that there's nothing you can do with it, right? So it, it, it turns out to be very hard in the beginning, you might anticipate, remember uh, Jacobo Anisi presented on the HM brain that he, uh, in one of the INCF conferences, and one might very well be able to say in the beginning that that's an extraordinarily valuable data set and needs to be very carefully preserved and very carefully you know, annotated because it's unique. But with a lot of the data that we generate, I think it it can be regenerated using better techniques. And that flux inside of neuroscience has always been a tough, you know, a, a tough road to hoe and when it comes to trying to predicting. But there are so, you know, the idea that I, I started to come in contact with the archivists who are a whole other group, right? These are the people that think about long-term preservations and there are fairly cheap storage uh, options for those. You know, everything doesn't need to be accessible all the time immediately. And so I think we have to start thinking about this in the long term. But I will say that all the repositories are dealing with what do I throw away and when do I throw it away? CERN so, apparently has solved that, but we haven't. <laughs> so, so one thing that uh, our funders actually requested we do uh, it, for, for this IDL project is draw up a living will, meaning should it happen that our funding is not renewed from any source, how what are we going to do um and at least for and i think that was a really good thing that every project ought to do absolutely for yeah. us the answer is that the bulk data is something that most people won't want most of the time and the pre-processed data is actually small enough to fit on dropbox um so 
so the, the, the pre-processed data would continue to be available while the bulk data would be put on tape in someone's garage. Um, but, but I think every project needs should have something like that. This also has a dimension of the funding, you know, because uh, this is a question also for the funders, the degree to which they should fund data repository that have some sort of mechanism that allows them to continue over time versus not, right? So it's, uh, it, and then what type of repository we need because tape is very cheap, but uh, our you know, the, the archives that are close to computers and supercomputers is much more expensive. So it, it, it's all the good discussion that need to happen as you know, we move to a globalist perspective to sharing neuroscience because, and, and, and also there's all the requirement that I brought into my talk about GDPR versus the Australia requirements versus the, the Chinese and Japanese requirements that are very different. And, and they, they, they constrain, you know, what type of data needs to be stored and what type of data can be shared and how it can be shared. So, I know in a certain way, in the working group that Marianne and KG and all of us have been discussing, we think we need an ambassador, or at least one. We, we think we need some person that, that, that actually think, and that's from the scientist perspective, that start thinking about how we start brokering across countries and nations um, something. And probably I, INCF or IBI would, could, could have a role into something like this, someone that help streamlining the processes. I'm not an expert on these legal aspects of it, but I'm very interested in making sure that um, the data can be shared. Not, so one dimension is how long and where, and the other dimension is how it can be shared. I think, Franco, I wanna add one other thing, and that is um, how do we reward for sharing? And um, I think one of the biggest problems, and we come into it over and over again, People will say, I've got this great data, but it is the legacy data for my postdocs, for my grad students, for my tenure, for my process. And until, and in fact, I talked with, um, I've, I've started to talk with a few people, faculty at UT, you know, the whole business of tenure for faculty and a, a lot of, a lot of, you know, um, the, the structure of science is, you know, there's a, there's a PI or there's, you know, a Max Planck director or there's somebody else whose career promotion depends on, um, you know, getting, getting their publications out and being first and, you know, being innovative. And um, if they've collected a bunch of really great data, they're not going to want to do what we're trying to do because we have the motivation from NSF. We will take those pictures on the electron microscope. And once we've got our database properly structured and capable of doing it, but as it comes off the microscope, it goes into a public domain before we've done any working with it. And I think that um, I can do that because I'm nearing the end of my career. And But people who are beginning their careers, who may have some of the most valuable data that's structured for the next generation of science, we haven't yet figured out how to truly reward people for big science and um, for um, sharing, you know, before they've mined it like I have for, you know, 40 years. <laughs> so Thanks. it's a, yeah. I think it's a real challenge to our community, to, the, to, to your community of, of creation of um, enough recognition for that. And, you know, there's ways that, you know, CERN has there that, you know, the, particle physicists have done it you get a little bit of you know get a point for every time you do something and when you get 10 points you get an acknowledgement when you get 20 points you get a you know a co-authorship with a thousand other people but but that in neuroscience and in a lot of academic uh, institutions that kind of work is simply disregarded as not your work so so here's a oh no sure go ahead like, so I'll, I'll be quick, but, but I, I couldn't agree more with what Kristen's raising. I think the incentive to data, to share data, but also just, just a system that actually values data as a core output of the scientific process is, 
fundamentally necessary. If you think about the amount of money that goes into these experiments, right? And then if, it's, if, if the use of that data is restricted to one lab over a certain amount of time to produce a few articles, no, I mean, it's still important articles and it's still important findings, but if you think about the potential to have many, many others discovering new insights, comparing across data sets, deriving much, much more value. I think if you make an economic argument, you know, maybe there's some motivation to say, let's, let's change this equation. Let's really focus on preserving this data, making it reusable as a fundamental part of the research process. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I, I would just say too that at the time I was getting ready to finally share, we call it lovingly volume Joseph, you know, that one, it was, um, it was the fact that nature, you know, put out science data and there was a place to publish. Right. There wasn't a new innovative finding in that paper. It was a how to use our tool and how to da 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 kind of thing. And also um, Josh Fogelstein had created the Open Connectum. So there was a place to put the data. And so I think the combination of a high, high profile journals allowing you to you know, have a citable publication and a place where you know, it's obvious that that publication is going to be putting that data that that was a that was a switch point for me. It became sufficiently incentivized by the publication domains that were available, and the um, the environment. Now, Open Connectome is not any longer the repository because they've moved on, right? But, which is a um, problem. Yes, <laughs> which is a problem. This is the kind yeah. of problem. And, and right. now we've put the data in other places and 3dm.org. Well, I, I, I'm hoping it'll last into perpetuity. It's on a supercomputer environment that's big time funded by Texas and NSF. But one of the things I think Marianne will remember from the very beginning, you know, I, I kept wanting to have the National Library of Medicine take this on as their mission that, you know, it really falls in the purview of our national and then now, now we're talking international, but that there be an institution that is way beyond commercial and way beyond the individual labs and way beyond these individual repositories that a lot of people already use the API PubMed um, as, a, as, as the kind of environment in which um, individual laboratories could easily participate. I mean, we have to already put our data yeah you know, on PubMed. So anyway, I, I just I just think that um, the, these things will help. And Kenneth, I don't, I, I think I've interrupted you twice. Well, just, and then I'll let Ken go. I just say, Kristen, that PubMed Central is now going to let you deposit data sets associated with uh, PubMed Central articles. So they are taking on some of that, but they believe that the right place for these are in the specialized community repositories. It's just, what do you do if there isn't one? So these these things are all happening. Yeah. So, um, yeah, to, to, to this point about incentives, I, I don't know. I mean, I think things do change. So if you think back, you know, five years ago, preprints were pretty much unheard of in neuroscience. Now it's getting to the point, not there yet, but it's getting to the point where if you don't publish a preprint before your paper, people think, oh, what's, why, why didn't they do that? What are they trying to hide? There's something dodgy about this. And it will get to the stage, I would predict, pretty soon, that if you don't release your data, everyone's going to go, what are you trying to hide? There's something wrong with this. And, and I say this because with the IBL, the, the first thing we did when we were starting is talk to people in, in, in genomics and stuff, and they were really pretty shocked about mm -hmm. the fact that in neuroscience, you don't always release all your data because, of course, you do that. That's what they've been doing for 10, 20 years now. Um, so I don't know, I, I would predict that actually this is going to change to the extent that if somebody doesn't release their data along with a paper, everyone's going to assume that, that the paper is, is, is flawed. I don't know, we'll, we'll see if that's true. Um, also, there was a, a, a question from, from Lydia Ng. Um, hello, Lydia. Um, uh, about the living will, is it designed for the time? 
if you have to activate the delete. I think what I'm understanding that to mean is, are we ready, you know, if we have to, you know, if we cut, how long is it gonna take um, to, to get the data in a kind of cryo-preserved state, so to speak? And it's, it's not ready now. We're assuming we'll have a few months and enough funds left to buy some tapes. Um, but I think, you know, we've, we've, we've got that baked into the budget. Um, so, so it's something, you know, you know, if, if the bomb drops, then we are in trouble. But um, as long as, you know, it, you know, if it just turns out the grants don't get renewed, then we'll be okay, if that was your question. Right, so uh, yeah, it's already uh, uh, the time uh, we should be closing. So uh, I will ask uh, uh, the Miriam uh, for a uh, closing remark. I feel bad. I think Jan wanted to say a point. Do we have time for one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'll add one point, Marianne, thanks. And Sharon as well, I think you had something to say. Yeah. It's very tempting to comment further on this important topic yes. of um, <laughs> credit to giving credit to people mm -hmm. and young scientists starting up. Uh, I think there is some hope here because uh, many services, of course, now provide DOIs for data sets uh, that makes the data sets uh, citable. It's also possible for services to uh, make it easy to search for names of people and actually see how many DOIs do you have in this database. We do it in the eBrains data knowledge services. So you can actually, if you post there, you can actually mm -hmm. um, put in your name in the search, click contributor, and you actually have a full list that you can just add to your CV. And the next thing is that Marianne is now going to solve the problem of, of citations for the DOIs, I hope. Yes. <laughs> we, we, we need to get that done, right? So we don't only have a Google Scholar where we take all the publications, but we, we want that to show also the data coming up. Mm -hmm. and, and this, I think, will continue. So the sooner the younger scientists start on this track, the better their position they will be in five to ten years from now. And as Ken points out, this is already there. It's just something that we have to, to push a little bit in neuroscience. That's a great point. I'll be very quick. Mm -hmm. um, just in our discussion of, you know, how do you decide which data are important? I wanted to point out that um, computational neuroscience, people who create models might have different ideas from experimentalists about which data are important. It's getting harder and harder to get, you know, just some of the basic things that you need for a new species or something like that to create good models uh, because of the type of data that are being created at this point. So I just want to throw that out. Yeah. So um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to wrap up. This was an excellent session. I think it highlighted the important work that was going on in the IBI and also um, this need for collaboration. And I think you saw the collaboration between IBI and the INCF, right? This is a very large space and there's room for everybody. But it was really uh, nice to hear from Kristen and Ken. And one of the things that a lot of people had noticed was that neuroscience was largely insulated from a lot of the movements that have been going on in open science and FAIR. And that's really why the INCF and IBI have come into existence is to really bring those to neuroscience. So a lot of the issues that Ken and Kristen brought up have been discussed in organizations like the Research Data Alliance. And there's a lot of uh, the libraries are getting very involved in preservation of scientific data and bringing their skill set on metadata to how one deals with it. As Jan mentioned, data citation has been something I've been very much involved in through Force 11, the idea that data sets should be considered a primary product of research. And if you spend a lot of time organizing and annotating them, then they are a research project unto themselves that ought to be treated like the research article. Um, data publications is another very important way of doing it. But the idea there was that you could be able to use the apparatus that we currently have in DOIs of being able to track citations to track citations of data sets. But I will say, it's not an instantaneous process, <laughs> as Ken noted, right? You can set up this infrastructure, but it still fails one out of a hundred times because these are new connections that are being made and new software that has to be developed. So the publishers are well aware that even though we've all agreed in theory that data sets should be cited, there's still a lag in making sure that all the infrastructure gets there and works, but it, it's coming. So I think I reiterate uh, what I've said in a lot of uh, uh, talks recently, where we are now compared to where we were 20 or 30 years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago is, is vastly different. And what I'm really pleased to see is how much 
people of all walks of life in neuroscientists, the modelers, the experimentalists, and others are realizing that this, this change is coming, right? Whether the credit systems and everything have caught up yet, they are coming. We get to define them though, right? Unlike again, all of the norms that come, came about over scientific articles, those were in place when we all sort of joined, but we get to define what's going on here now, people at all levels. And so I think one really needs to seize that and say there's a real opportunity. But I really encourage everyone again to work through organizations like the IBI and the INCF because this is where these types of discussions can happen even as agree 100% with both Kenneth and Kristen, at some point you gotta go back to your laboratory and get some work done. And I think that the systems that we're trying to define for neuroscience are flexible enough that they recognize right, the nature of neuroscience data, the nature of technological flux, and the procedures that we'll put in place or the recommendations will, will accommodate, right, the nature of neuroscience. It's not genomics with its very well-defined data type that they've been sharing uh, forever, right? It's much more complicated. So it's really great to start to see, right, really the sort of penetration of these ideas across multiple laboratories, multiple groups, and I'm really, um, you know, I'm hopeful for the future, even as I don't think any of us underestimates, right, the difficulties of what we're trying to do. But it's exciting if you think about it, right? You, never, you don't often get to invent a new system of scholarly communication and reward, right? But we, we've been right in the middle of it. So I think as, when we look back at our careers, we'll be very gratified that we were able to participate. So those are my thoughts. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, everybody. Mm -hmm. Ken and uh, uh, Kristen for joining uh, this uh, meeting. Yeah. So hopefully uh, we would make uh, further progress and then uh, have an opportunity to uh, uh, talk with a wider uh, committee uh, maybe uh, sometime uh, next year. Hopefully we can physically join at that opportunity. Yes. <laughs> that would be lovely. Thank you all very much. And Ken, yeah. I put in the strong one. <laughs> oh, yes, yes, that's where it was. Right. The neocortex. Yeah. And it was in Germany, not where you are. <laughs> I'd like to also thank you for all the opportunity. Thank you. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.